Father. Greetings to everybody from uh, Truth on the Web Ministries in uh, Church of God Woodstock here. Glad to have you with us. And today we're uh, going to get some uh, food for thought for when you fast. I know. Yes, I know it's June. It, it's, and uh, yes, and it's, yeah, Dave Atonement is, is not like around the corner. But. But if that's what you're wondering, <clears throat> this is a good message for you. <clears throat> so fasting, what it, you know? First of all, what is fasting? Does this mean you just have an empty plate that you're just not eating? Uh, no, there's a, you know, it's like a, like baptism. Just because someone goes underwater in a pool doesn't mean they've been baptized. They just went underwater. Just because you go without food doesn't mean you're fasting. All right? It's a matter of the heart and uh, in matter of seeking after God and drawn near to him uh, through self-affliction all right so fasting is uh, seen as an act of worship uh, as recorded in the book of Luke uh, in Luke chapter 2 verse 36 and 37 we read of Anna who was a prophetess she was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, uh, and she was of great age. She had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity and had been a widow for 84 years now. Uh, but she didn't depart from the temple. She stayed there worshiping with fastings and petitions night and day. <clears throat> so now here's a, here's a woman who uh, had apparently... Uh, become a young widow, uh, but she devoted herself to God uh, instead of being, as we're warned about in the book of Timothy, about the young widows will often go about gallivanting, becoming a busybody and, and wax and wanton. Uh, this Anna was actually a prophetess who devoted herself to God and worshipped him with fasting and petitions or prayers before God night and day. Uh, here at the temple. So we see fasting is an act of worship. Now granted, again, there's people who fast for other reasons. People who, some, like there's a, there's a fad out for a lot of people who go off and fast for their health. You, yes, you can fast for your health, but don't think while you're fasting for your health, you're fast, fasting for God. You, right? There's two different things going on. <clears throat> All right. That'd be self worship in that case, not God oriented worship. Uh, we do see on uh, the book from the book of Jonah that uh, fasting is, uh, is an example of seeking our Creator's face. If you remember when Jonah had come there and he uh, pronounced to them that there was a coming judgment upon the people of Nineveh for their sins and their violence and everything that God saw of them, uh, that the people heard God, that they heard God through Jonah. They believed God. As it says right here, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. So this is very much like, uh, like we see like in, in James. Their faith was made perfect through works. Their belief, their, they believed God, that was their faith, and their faith was made evident by their actions, that they proclaimed a fast. Uh, and this fast is the Hebrew word zom. We'll look at that shortly in the message here. Uh, <clears throat> but this is one of the examples where the scripture defines the word itself. You can tell what it's talking about by the context. Right? They proclaim a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So from the king on to the pauper. Um, and the word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne. He laid down his robe from him. He covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and of his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So here he is defining, they proclaimed a fast. 
That's one way of saying it. And the other way of saying it is they proclaimed, don't taste anything, don't feed, don't drink water. So this was a complete fast, no food, no drink. <clears throat> And they were doing this to seek the face of God, that God would relent of what he prophesied through Jonah. They said, let, we wasn't to stop with this, no man eat and drink. He said, let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Let them turn everyone from his evil way. Repentance. And from the violence that's in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works. That they returned from their evil way and God relented of the evil that he had said he would do to them and he did it not. So we see here their saddest face, and they did it through humbling themselves, like the king taking off his royal garb, everyone covering themselves with sackcloth. And then no one touching food or drink. Turning from their sin and crying mightily out to God. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Like I said from the start here, I wanted to say, if you notice, this is titled, When You Fast. And that's actually from a couple of scriptures right over our Lord's mouth, and we'll be getting to those. It's not if you fast. It's when you fast. And the when you fast, is he isn't, we'll see when we get to that scripture, contextually, he is not talking about the Day of Atonement. And you can tell it from the context. Context, context, context. We'll make that clear. It'll be clear that he expects his disciples to fast at other times besides the Day of Atonement. All right? <clears throat> In Acts chapter 10, we see Cornelius uh, had been fasting and seeking the Lord's face. He wanted to uh, find out about salvation through Jesus Christ. He wanted to know he was a Gentile. And he, he was one who was known for his great alms that he would give and his great care and love for the people and his love for God. And so while he was praying, he says, uh, four days ago I was fasting into this hour. At the ninth hour I prayed in my house. Behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. He said, Cornelius, your prayer is heard and your gifts to the needy I remembered in the sight of God. So you see here, Cornelius was fasting and praying, seeking the face of God. And God revealed himself here through an angel to tell Cornelius the way to find Peter and through Peter hear that, that old, old story, the wonderful words of life of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Acts 13, uh, when the assembly that was at Antioch, there were some prophets and some teachers, and Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they served the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate Barnabas and Saul for me, for the work to which I have called them. And notice this, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So the Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul, and people still fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them. Again, seeking God's face, seeking the seal of God upon them, uh, and that God's will be done. <clears throat> they were seeking his face. Acts 14.23, when they had appointed elders for them in every assembly, and they prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Now, 
we know we have the pastoral epistles. We have what Paul wrote to Timothy, First and Second Timothy. We have Titus. And we have the explanations in there of who to appoint when you're going to ordain elders. He's telling them, Timothy, hey, I want you to ordain elders here. I, Titus wants you to ordain elders there. And he says, here's, here's the list. You look for a man who's not greedy of filthy lucre. He's, a, he's a faithful to his wife. His children are in subjection. He's not a brawler. He's not, and he has this list. But notice they didn't just rely just on a list. He said that they prayed with fasting on these ones that they appointed elders for they, and commended them to the Lord. They appointed, well, they appointed the elders of every assembly and they prayed with fasting and they commended them to the Lord. Um, how are you questioning that? Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't say how long they were praying, how long they were fasting. It doesn't state what's going on with that. But, you know, it's like even much like with the replacement of, uh, of uh, Judas. You know, they looked to the Lord in that, cast on a lot. What would it be? What's the vote? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, it looks like they were looking for God's uh, uh, seal upon their, their choice, as it were. Or their... All right, so the Day of Atonement, afflicting your soul. So this is the, the main one that people think of when they hear the word fasting in the churches of God. They think of the Day of Atonement. Uh, though uh, over uh, probably the last 10 years or so, I've seen a, a wind of doctrine come about that actually tries to separate fasting from the Day of Atonement, um, arguing over what the meaning is of afflicting your soul. Okay. So back in Leviticus 23, 27, 29, it says, On the tenth day of this seventh month, there will be a day of atonement. It shall be a, a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the eternal. You shall do no work on that same day, for it's a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the eternal your God. Whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not be afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. Um Interesting here, because basically he's saying to uh, afflict your souls, or in this case, he's basically saying cut off your appetite. As we're going to see this in the scripture. Cut it off or you'll be cut off, is what he's saying. Uh, the Hebrew in here, um, going to keep it simple. We're going to come down to a couple of words, anah and nephesh. Anah is the word translated afflict, nephesh, your soul. And... Uh, you're looking at that. He says, whatever soul it should be that does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You should do no manner of work. It's a statute forever uh, throughout your generations. In all your dwellings, you shall be a Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even to even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So it's telling us here we got to afflict our souls for the Day of Atonement. Well, what is the meaning of afflict your souls? <clears throat> like I said, it's the Hebrew is um, in the simplest form, anah nefesh. Uh, we see this back in Leviticus 16.29. Uh, it shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, again, still talking about the Day of Atonement, you shall afflict your soul and do no work at all whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourns among you. In Numbers 29, 7, you shall have on the tenth day of the seventh month a holy convocation, you should do, and you shall afflict your souls and not do any work therein. So we can continually see this is a, uh, a complete Sabbath ceasing, um, and it's a time of afflicting your souls for this 24-hour period from the ninth day when it ends until the tenth day ends. Sunset to sunset, or even to even. <clears throat> so affliction. What is affliction? Well, the Hebrew word is hamah, and it's used uh, a 
give some highlights here. Genesis 15, 13. He said to Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Okay, so this is obviously the, the um, when Abram is being told about what's going to happen to his descendants, um, starting with the persecution of Isaac at his weaning party from Ishmael, uh, when Ishmael persecuted him, uh, on through the affliction under Egypt when uh, God leads them out under the hand of Moses. Uh, so this, that's the Hebrew word anah. They shall afflict them 400 years. Exodus 1.12 says, uh, this is, of course, more of the affliction prior to um, the, uh, the enslavement. It says, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So the more they afflicted Israel, Israel was producing more children, um, which is also the great lesson for us in that the more we're afflicted, the more we should be multiplying and growing. You know, uh, and that we kind of see that example in the New Testament too, as the persecution came on the church. It's when the church actually began to flourish more. You know, they multiplied and grew as they were afflicted. In Genesis 16:6, 6, Abram said unto Sarai, "Behold, your maid is in your hand, Hagar, uh, to do with her as it pleases you." And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, Hagar fled from Sarai's face. Uh, the, the term dealt hardly with is anah. Also in the same chapter, verse 9, when the angel of the Lord appeared unto Hagar and said, Return to your mistress, Sarai, and submit thyself under her hands. And that's anah. So we see Anna could be a flick, to be dealt hardly with, or to submit yourself under. We also see here in Exodus 10.3 that Moses and Aaron came to the Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to Anna yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. And here we have that translated humble. He wasn't asking Pharaoh to afflict himself as in whip himself or do some sort of physical, yeah, self-flagellation. He asked him to humble himself. Um, Deuteronomy 8.3, we see that he anod you, was God talking to Israel, he anod you and suffered you to hunger. And fed you with manna. So we see here more of the correlation where we get this is this is one of the definitions leading more towards the fasting connection here. That part of the humbling in this case is that he suffered them to hunger. And he fed them with manna, which they knew not. Neither did their fathers know that they that he might make you know that man is not lived by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So, likewise, a great lesson for us, things to remember that, yes, our, we, God designed our bodies that we need food and drink, right? Our bodies cannot survive without food and drink, right? But he can humble us and brings us into times to recognize that it ain't this bread, it ain't this drink, his word that's going to actually sustain us. <clears throat> Psalm 119, uh, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. These are all uh, forms of afflict uh, of ana, as you'll see where I have the, the words highlighted in here. This is often the case for most of us here. Uh, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept your word. And it, it took God to come in and kind of 
touch us on the on the hip as it were, you know, put our hip out of joint like Jacob or something, as we've been fighting against them, and we need to be afflicted, and then we're humbled and submit to the affliction. Again, in that same uh, Psalm 119, verse 71, it's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. So affliction, we see, brings you back from being astray, helps you to keep the word, helps you to learn the statutes. Solomon, in uh, his wisdom, said in Ecclesiastes 1.13, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all the things that are done under heaven. This sore travail has God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. <clears throat> so we see here this is Anah, and he says the same type of thing in, in chapter 3, 3.10. I have seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Life is often a rat race, or we have lots of curveballs thrown at us through life, lots of pop quizzes that come at us. And these things are here to exercise us. Like Israel in the wilderness, to be tested and proved. How are we going to live? Are we going to turn to God in this? Are we going to seek his face in these things? Or seek our own? Isaiah 58, verse 3, he says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and you see not? Talking to God. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and you know knowledge? Now that word fasted there, that's the Hebrew word that we saw earlier, zom, which is fast. And so here's one of those doublets in Hebrew. Wherefore have we zomed, and you see it not? Excuse the Hebrew. I'm going to try to make this simple. So I'm going to use Hebrew with some... English endings, so we understand it, a mixture of Hebrew and English, Hebrewish. Um, wherefore have we zoomed, and you don't see, wherefore have we anod, our nephesh, and you take no knowledge. So zooming in, a, in afflicting our soul, or, or um, anaing our nephesh, are equal terms here. It's a Hebrew doublet. Saying the same thing twice with different, you know, different words. And he says, Behold, in the day of your fast, or your zome, you find pleasure and you exact all your labors. Behold, you zome for strife and for debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not zome as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is this a zome that I have chosen? A day for a man to anah his nephesh? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? And here he's, he's talking about, what is it if you're just going through the motions? If you're just, again, doing liturgy. If you, oh, this is, oh, this, oh I see that man. Oh, I saw what Nineveh did. They, they took off their clothes. They put on sackcloth, ashes. They fasted. Okay, that's what i got to do. And it's just the motion. It's not the heart. So that's not what I called you for. <clears throat> hey, I'm going on a diet. I must be annoying my soul. Well, in a one sense, yeah, but not in the sense that God's looking for. That's not the spiritual fasting. It says in verse 10, if you will draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall your light rise in obscurity and your darkness be as the noonday. Now here again, you draw out your soul to the hungry, you satisfy the anad nephesh. <clears throat> now, nephesh, most of the COGs know that word because of the whole debate over the immortality of the soul and all that stuff. It's, it's a word often translated soul, but it has other meanings besides soul. It's actually its root would come down to the throat, uh, breath, which goes through the throat, and food, which goes so appetite. It all comes down to matters of the throat. Um, and so it, what it's saying here, you can draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy 
satisfy the afflicted appetite. So it's a contrast with the sat with the satisfied hunger to satisfy the afflicted appetite. <clears throat> In Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 and 23, when I proclaimed a zome, or a fast, there at the river of Hava, that we might of ourselves before our God, to seek of him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and a horseman to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them that, all them for good, that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all of them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So we see fasting again is connected with afflicting ourselves, or afflicting ourselves is fasting. And it was, they do it to be, uh, be uh, seeking God to be entreated. Psalm 35, 13, As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, and I humbled my soul with fasting. I anod Ephesh with zoming. Again, excuse the Hebrewish, trying to keep it simple. My prayer returned unto my own bosom. So again, we see prayer is tied right in, fasting and prayer tied in together, and it's humbling your soul or afflicting your appetite. And here's a great example of what I'm talking about where it's appetite. Proverbs 23, 2 says, Put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. The Hebrew and the word appetite is the Hebrew word nephesh. Obviously, it doesn't mean soul. If you're a man given to soul, soul food maybe. But it's obviously the context is here. Context, context, context telling us that the meaning is appetite. It's talking about desiring the king's dainties. But uh, put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. So we're told to afflict our appetite on the Day of Atonement. But we need to um, we need to be curbing our appetites, and and this is uh, in the lesson of fasting. You actually gain a tool to realize how much you can really overcome by the spirit and the renewal of the mind and how much you can curb every appetite. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, Paul says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection owed her, talking about marital intimacies, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife doesn't have authority of her own body, but the husband Likewise, also the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife. So don't deprive one another unless it's by consent for a season. Well, what's that season? That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then you may be in together again that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But he says, so here he's talking about he was answering the question, is it is good for a man to touch a woman, blah, 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 you know, but hey, if you can't can't contain, it's better to marry than to burn, and tell you what, your 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 body belongs to your spouse, your spouse's body belongs to you. Don't defraud, don't say hey no to each other, except when you consent to giving yourselves to prayer and fasting, because fasting also includes curbing your sexual appetite as well, that you're devoting yourselves to God and your, your thoughts and everything is Godward, not of self, not of the flesh, and all of this. <clears throat> now, as I alluded to earlier, even here in the title, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, moreover, if you don't be like the hypocrites. No, he didn't. He said, when you fast, 
don't be like the hypocrites with sad faces. They disfigure their faces so that they may be seen by men to be fasting. Most assuredly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But you, when you fast, you anoint your head, wash your face, so you're not seen by men to be fasting. But your father who's in the secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now again, context, context, context. Is he talking about the Day of Atonement? How do you know that? How do you know that? Because he's talking about secret fasting. If it's the Day of Atonement, he's talking to Israelites, first of all. Everyone in there fasts for the Day of Atonement. And so everyone's going to be fasting that day, so it's no secret that you're fasting on the Day of Atonement. Right? So when you fast, here is not talking about the Day of Atonement. But the point is, he expects there to be fasting outside of the Day of Atonement in his, in his body amongst his disciples. In Matthew 9, uh, 14 and 15, when John's disciples came to him, came to Jesus, they said, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said, again, the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom's with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Our bridegroom's been taken from us. So he dwells in each one of us. So fasting is also a great faith builder. So not only is this something to draw near to God, humble us, and a uh, great faith builder. In Matthew 17, uh, verse 14 to 21, when they came to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, for, and my, or on my son, he's an epileptic and suffers grievously. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't cure him. And Jesus answered, faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon went out of him, and the boy was cured from that very hour. Now here, I want to say this. I just put a little side road here. This is a demon that manifested is what they saw as epilepsy. I'll tell you, there are we read, read a whole lot about demons in the New Testament. You think they're all gone? They're gone away? What do you think is going on in this world when we read of these people with these mental illnesses and the like? Guess what? We have powers to tread on scorpions and serpents. All right? We have power over these things. Jesus rebuked him, and a demon went out of him. The boy was cured from that hour, and the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why weren't we able to cast it out? And he said, because of your unbelief. For most assuredly, I tell you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and you tell this mountain, move from here to there, it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. This kind of doesn't go up by prayer and fasting. But what do we see prayer and fasting does? It draws us near to the Father, right? We actually plugged in. He says it was their unbelief. It's a matter of faith. So, are you hungry when you fast? Right? It's natural. God, again, did God design the body for food and drink? Yes, he did. Did God design the body to alert us, hey, I need a refuel? You know, like our, our body has an idiot light like your car does, you know, that tells you, hey, I'm going to be out of gas. Your stomach goes, rrr, rrr, I'm going to be out of gas, right? So, but we can learn from those things, and I to me, one of our own fasting, it's a great lesson to me. It always brings lots of verses to my mind, and I want to get, have those verses in your mind when the, those that system sounds off. 
during fasting. You know, so some food for thought while we're when we fast. Not if, when. Right? Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not will not be hungry, but he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Alright? Food for thought. Knowing that he is the bread of life. That uh and, I, and again, I think of this in, in the realm of uh, Deuteronomy 8.3, which we just had reference, or Matt 4.4, or Luke 4.4, 4, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. That this is the bread that we need to eat to live forever. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will never hunger or thirst for anything else, because only he satisfies. John 7:37, uh, and also in John 4:14, 4, Jesus stood and cried, "If anyone is thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again." What water is that He gives us? What? Then what is that? The Spirit of God. The water that I give him will become in, become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. We were just reading about this this past Sunday as well, about that earnest of the Spirit that He's given us, the just the rivers of living water that flow from the belly. Psalm 42, on this one I think a lot about because we sing as the deer, um, or also I think of a, one of my favorite Bands is a, a, a band called the Sons of Korah, not the same Sons of Korah who wrote it, but the Sons of Korah who are alive today, a band out of Australia. They record the Psalms, uh, put them to music, and um, so I constantly think of uh, think of those when I read these Psalms. But uh, the Psalms, uh, the Scriptures, a lot they give us. I mean, if we would sit back and um, they they paint us pictures, like they're like word pictures, you know. Kind of like in the days of the old radio shows where you had to hear, you know, picture everything in your mind. You know, these days we got screens that paint the pictures for us, but there's so much in these scriptures. The word pictures here, you know, as the deer pants for the for the water brooks, so my soul pants after you, God. My soul thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You know. <clears throat> I think uh, think of my dog oftentimes in the summertime. I'm seeing them outside, out there panting. You know what dogs look for their tongue all hanging out, all <laughs> panting, looking for the looking for the water. Um, <clears throat> do we thirst for God after that? I think about again. These are thoughts I think when I'm when I'm fasting and I find myself thirsty. And you know you get that part where your your mouth's all parched and are we feeling that towards God that we have that desire do we pant after God do we recognize that he was teaching us a lesson with the mechanism of hunger and thirst that he put in us that he wants us to learn from these physical things about the heavenly things and he says and hear that my soul thirsts for God, for the living God, saying, when shall I come and appear before God? Like, I can't wait to see him again. You know, you know what that feels like? You can't wait to see him again? <laughs> when your soul thirsts for God like that, <laughs> is where we need to be. I mean, think about it. I mean, Little, again, a little side thing, but think about what you're willing to forsake to see each other, forsake sleep, for, forsake whatever else, so you can spend time with each other. How much more should we be thir thirsting and hungering after God, willing to forsake anything to spend time with Him? That's that first love that Ken and I often talk about. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> 
in this one? Let's see. Nope. Okay. Isaiah 26, uh, 8 to 9. Yea, in the, uh, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, have we did for you. The desire of our soul is to your name and to the remembrance of you. With my soul have I desired you in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek you early. For when your judgments are on the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. What does your soul desire? What do you hunger for? What are you thirsting for? Because again, as Jesus himself said, wherever, whatever we treasure, there our hearts will be also. <clears throat> this is a psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah, Psalm 63. And uh, I was thinking, when, like we were in, uh, you had some really dry, parched lands out there. Um, you can totally get the idea of what David was going through in these barren areas and thinking about thirsting. Yet he's thirsting for God. God, you are my God, I will earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. See, David allowed his physical thirst to actually point him to the ultimate reality that his, he can only be satisfied in God. God, you are my God, I will earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and weary land, there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary, watching your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and think about you in the night watches. He's out there hungering and, phys and physically hungering and thirsting, but saying, God, you will satisfy me. My soul will be satisfied like with the richest food. Can we walk in that same faith and love and desire for God? Darby said, to be hungry is not enough. I must really be starving to know what's in his heart towards me. When the prodigal son was hungry, he went to feed on the husk, but when he was starving, he turned to his father. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. When his affliction hit, he knew. When he was starving, he had to turn to his father. <clears throat> so you get hunger pangs, and you're thirsting, right? Where are your minds thinking on there? Yeah, you know, you got your pizza, and sorry, no pasta up there for you, Rodney. But uh, dogs, burgers, all that. What are you thinking of? You know, when you when you're hungry. And oftentimes, see what I'm thinking. I think it, it's kind of funny, like when you. When you're not fasting, you don't really think about it in your everyday life, but when you're fasting, you kind of think about how many times you might stop at the fridge even when you're not hungry to, like, just nab something. Or, like, you're just sitting watching TV and you're just start snacking on something there. You're not even hungry. You just you used to, are we that same way towards towards God? You know, like, hey, I'm not, I'm not you know, there's, I don't have any questions right now, but I really want to spend some time in his word. I'm full right now. I mean, the last time he gave me some answers, wow, I'm still full, but I can snack on some more, you know. <clears throat> what are you hungering and thirsting for? When we feel those hunger pangs, like I'm saying, these are these are the type of scriptures I want us to remember. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So again, when he gives me the physical hunger, physical thirst, I'm reminded he wants me to hunger and thirst after righteousness. 
and then walk in the faith that I'm going to be filled, that he will satisfy that desire. What is righteousness? Righteousness is being morally upright without guilt or sin. It's, it's in accordance with virtue and morality. It's being morally justif uh, justifiable. It's Christ-likeness. These are the things we're supposed to hunger and thirst for. Christ-likeness. Hunger and thirst for it. Do you have that? Do you have that at three times a day at least? I mean, you hunger for physical food at least three times a day. Most, most everybody has three meals, right? Maybe some snacks. Are we, are we hungering for Christ at least that much, if not all the day long? Or are we allowing other things to junk food to satisfy spiritual junk food to satisfy our longings or? even to get our taste buds off course and get us on a diet that's no good for us, spiritually speaking. We should be hungering for righteousness. And righteousness means that we're hungering to be, for hungering for righteousness is to be without sin, to be like Christ, to be holy. We should hunger and thirst for His righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Yes. Seek ye first His kingdom and His righteousness. Hunger and thirst for them. That's Again, what we treasure is what we're going to seek after. That's where our heart's going to be. If we treasure his kingdom and his righteousness, we're going to seek it first. We don't have to be told. There doesn't have to be any commandment to say, seek ye first this, because you're going to seek it first, because that's what you treasure. Right? You're going to seek what you want. Now, as far as someone's desire, you can tell someone's appetite by their portion, right? Well, we see that with people physically, but spiritually, which plate is yours? Well, spiritually, what plate is yours? What are you, what are you, des what are you desiring? His word, his walk, his righteousness, his kingdom. How much? Just a little bit? A lot of bit? I mean, when we got two plates set before us, which do you choose? What do you what do you what do you hunger and thirst after? Right? What we hunger after says a lot about us, and it reveals a lot to us. It's a spiritual mirror if we allow it to be. If we'll step back and take the time to say, what am I doing? What am I hungering and thirsting after? What are my priorities in life? What do I spend my time doing? What, do I, what am I choosing? I mean, if you think about life, life is, life is you're given the bank account, and you get a certain amount of money, which is our time. And once it's spent, you can't unspend it or respend it some other way. How are we choosing to spend the time that he's given us? What are we choosing to spend that, that time on? What are we treasuring? What are we hungering after? What are we thirsting after? Where are we trying to find satisfaction in other than Him?
Peter said that in his first letter that as a newborn babe, we should desire the sincere milk of the word. Think about a newborn baby. We've had babies in, the, in this congregation before. We've had babies in our house. How's a baby someone who's not getting fed? Wah, right? We are supposed to desire the milk of the word the same way the baby desires mama's milk. The baby knows when there's something wrong. When I need sustenance. When so it's much more than when. <laughs> Do we have that desire as newborn babes for the word as, as we should? As a newborn babe, it's not saying oh only newborn babe only baby Christians should feel that way. It's not what it's saying. The contrast is a baby towards the milk. Christians towards the word. Not newborn Christians. Newborn babies towards milk. Christians towards the word. Do we hunger for the for the word of God that we can grow by it? Yeah. We want you know, a little more. <clears throat> when we fast, one thing we should never fast. Are you trying to wonder what book that is? We should. <laughs> Let's see. See, I'm looking all close. When <laughs> we should never fast from the will of God and the Word of God, as it were. Now, I'm not saying you're required to read a Bible every day of your life. I mean. We have no evidence that Adam ever had a Bible. or, Of course, he didn't have Genesis. I mean, Moses wrote that stuff. But people can walk with God separate from that. But I'm, I'm saying we shouldn't ever fast from the Word of God, whether it's the written Word or the Word of God. But that is our sustenance. That is life. Don't ever thirst for it. Again, so when you get that hunger pain, it's another verse to think of. John 4, 32 and 34. I have food to eat that you don't know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So when you're fasting and you get a hunger pain, you should say, is there anything more I could be doing for the Father right now? Is there anything more I could be doing to spread the kingdom of God here on earth? Is there anyone I can reach out to now with the word of God and let them know the good news of Jesus Christ? Because Jesus says the food he had to eat was to accomplish the work the Father gave. Well, what work did the Father give us? That should be our food, and it should satisfy us. So again, we'll be hunger and thirst. And again, not just when we're fasting. At any time you feel the hunger, hunger and thirst, you should think of these verses. The hunger and thirst for his righteousness and his kingdom to remember to be about doing his will. That that's the food we should be concerned with. My food is to do the work of God. Visit the sick, visit those in prison, take in the homeless, feed the hungry, tell the gospel to every creature. Proverbs 16.26 says, The appetite of laborers works for them. Their hunger drives them on. You ever see the guy out on the street corner will work for food? His appetite is going to 
it's going to work for him because his hunger is going to make them go off to do the job because he wants to get fed. What does your hunger drive you to do? What do you have an appetite for? And what does your appetite work for you? Is it only work temporal things? Does it work eternal things? In Luke 2.49, uh, when Jesus was uh, 12, he had been up for the, for the days of the Passover with his family, and they went on, left him with our family, and didn't know he stayed behind questioning the uh, the teachers of the law and all that. You know, I don't mean like asking them, oh, tell me how to explain this to me, but like asking them a question that melted in their mind, like, hey, if David's the son of, uh, if the Messiah is the son of David, how, why does David call him Lord? Okay, yeah, something like that. So he's there with them and doing that, and his family comes looking for him, and he says, why is it that you see me? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Again, his food is to do the will of him who sent him. Did you not know that we must be about our father's business? Do the work of God, right? My will is to do the work of him who sent me. In Matthew 25, Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed are my father, and here at the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. All those things. I said we should be hungering for these, to do these now, fasting can also be a self-chosen trial. Now, if life isn't throwing you enough at the time. What's that? Yeah. Even when you feel it's too many. Whoa. Slow it down. Count it all joy, my brothers, sisters, when you fall into various temptations or trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So our various trials, temptations, it's there to test our faith, to produce endurance, you know, long-suffering, the ability to trust God to sustain us. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, Not only this, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering works perseverance. Much like James just said. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character gives us hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, what was given, which was given unto us. Second Corinthians 12, 9 to 10 says, He says unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses and in injuries and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Maybe we're spending too much time leaning on our own flesh thinking our own arm is going to do things. Maybe we need to weaken the body, physical body. Afflict our appetite. Draw near to God and lean on Him in His arm. That His grace be sufficient for us. That His power be made perfect in our weakness.
Hebrews 12, 11 says, No, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Again, as we saw with the, the affliction, uh, like in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and chapter 3, we saw that God given us things in life that occur that are extra to exercise us. These afflictions that happen upon us, the chastenings, they not be, not be joyous when we go going through them. They might be grievous when we're going through them. People feel that way, you know, we had our kids starting as, as little, doing the Day of Atonement fast. And be like, oh, it's almost over, you know. And they feel them all afflicted, grievous. But those things are working in us a more of a peaceable fruit of righteousness if we allow ourselves to be exercised by them. One that we see that we can be sustained isn't it funny how, <clears throat> you ever notice on, on the Day of Atonement that you can go 24 hours without eating food, and that 24 hours somehow is a little easier than maybe the time between like lunch and dinner, and like all of a sudden you're starving for dinner, and you're like, oh, you're freaking out, like I'm starving. But we have years built up of a show, we can go 24 hours without food, we'll be freaking out at this instance. You know what I'm saying? We should be... Building <laughs> faith upon faith, you know. These things are our examples. These things are our examples where that we're being exercised thereby that we can know. If we know, look, we're going we're gonna to fast from sunset to sunset. We're going to do this. And we come in and we set the boundaries. Here's the standard. And guess what? We all attain that standard. Huh. Maybe that can apply to other days, too, and other things, too, right? Because, like I'm saying, are you catch, catch what I'm saying between, like, everyday life where you all of a sudden you feel like you're starving and I can't go without food? But you know you can because you do it for 24 hours on the Day of Atonement. Why is the bar lower over here? Why are we changing it? Right? <clears throat> I showed this slide earlier. Uh, I just wanted to highlight Psalm 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, and now I've kept your word. And uh, they will bring in a commentary on this, uh, Psalm 119, 67 here, Albert Barnes. He says, The effect has been to recall me from my wanderings, and to turn me to paths of duty and holiness. This is an effect often, very often experienced. This is the language which can be used by many a child of God. Of those who are the children of God, it may be said that they are always benefited sooner or later by afflictions. Benefited sooner or later by afflictions. It may not be at the time of the affliction, like Hebrews 12, 11, but the ultimate effect is in all cases to benefit them. Because all things work for God. Yes, okay. Now, some error is corrected. Some evil habit changed. Some mode of life that is not consistent with religion is forsaken. Pride is humbled. The heart is quickened in duty. Habits of prayer are resumed or formed for the first time. The uh, affections are fixed on a better world. The soul is made more gentle calm, humble, spiritual, pure. Afflictions are the most precious means of grace. They are entirely under the direction of God. They may be endlessly varied and adapted to the case of every individual. But I think it's very wise, yea, and even our Lord said so, when you fast, that we choose to afflict ourselves, and we should choose to do it more often than we do. You think back a few years ago when we're, that was great, right? How close, the walk, that was awesome. <clears throat> so fasting is about curbing our appetites. Now, 
I've, throughout this, though, I've been not just talking about curbing our appetites, but I was actually talking about redirecting our appetites vertically to have our appetite for the kingdom, for his righteousness, for his work to accomplish his will here on earth. <clears throat> but there's many appetites we have here on earth. In Philippians 3.19, these, I guess you can, to borrow Jesus' words, these would be sons of Gehenna, children of Gehenna, because it says their end is destruction, their God is their belly, their glory is in their shame, and they think about earthly things. The God is their belly. People, whatever we have a hunger and thirst for, that's what we're going to chase after. And if it's earthly things, that's what we're thinking about, we're going to be serving the flesh. And the end, is stated right here, is destruction. We can't serve the God of the belly and the God of heaven and earth. Again, we need to put a knife to our throat if we're a man given to appetites. What do you hunger and thirst for? What are you struggling? What are you struggling with carnality-wise in the battle against sin? Can you not put a knife to your throat? We can, can't we? Do we choose to? Or you say, your hunger's too much, it must be satisfied. I'm too thirsty for it. I have to have it. I tell you, we can. In fact, we're commanded to. If our right eye causes you to stumble, we're supposed to pluck it out and throw it away from us. It's possible that one of our members should perish and our whole body be cast into the lake of fire. If our hand or our foot causes us to stumble, we're supposed to cut it off and cast it from us. Because it's better to enter into life maimed or crippled than having two hands or two feet and being cast into the eternal fire. Now, is Jesus really, is there going to be a bunch of one-eyed Christians half sitting with, in wheelchairs or hooked hands, Captain Hook? Captain, yeah, he has the eye patch and everything. Captain Hook's the ultimate Christian. Peg leg. He, I did it all for you, Jesus. I plucked out my eye, lost my hand, and I got a peg leg. No. No, it's not Captain Hook. That's the problem. He was hooked. But he wasn't hooked on Jesus, right? He was hooked on his own appetites. Arr. But he's telling us that we have the power to overcome sin. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. The God can't be tempted by evil. He whom he himself tempts no one, God. But each one is tempted when we're drawn away by our own lust and enticed. Then lust or hunger, appetite, when it's conceived, it bears sin, and the sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. It's us. It's what we hunger and thirst for. And do we have the ability to change our taste buds and what we hunger and thirst for? We have the ability to change our diet. Yes, we do, by the grace of God. We are told that we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Every thought captive to Christ. Not just on Sabbath, not just on, on feast days. Every day, every moment, bring every thought captive 
to obedience to Christ. Now, if we actually kept this one commandment, what sin would you what sin would you be doing? Zero, not a single one, would you? You wouldn't be committing sin because you would have brought every thought subject to Christ. Let me ask you this. Can you go five seconds without sinning? One, two, three, four, five. How'd you guys do? You guys do it? You guys make it five seconds without sinning? How about 10 seconds? You do 10 seconds without sinning? How about 30 seconds? Can you do 30 seconds without sinning? Can you go a minute without sinning? If I sat here and started the clock, can we go 60 seconds without sinning? Hmm. Think on that. Let me ask you something. How do you eat a whole cow? One bite at a time. One bite at a time. <clears throat> Maybe you need to break it down, you know. They got the, the concept one day at a time. You know, we just talked about five seconds at a time. You guys said, oh, that's nothing. That's easy. All right. Well, guess what? Your day is made up of a series of five seconds. If you say it's so easy to go without sin for five seconds, then we should be sinless, right? Because all oh, this is five seconds, then five seconds repeated, then five seconds repeated, then five seconds repeated. Right? What excuse do we have for sinning? None. Right? Does the body need food and drink to survive? We went over this. What's the answer? Does the body need food and drink to survive? Yes, it does. Okay. Yet, we know we can fast. Right? We can go a day without food or drink and still survive. Though our body needs it to survive. We can go three days without food or drink and survive. Though our body... We had men like Moses and Elijah and Jesus who've gone 40 days without food and drink and survived. Hmm. Let me ask. Does your body need to sin to survive? Hmm. So, you know from experience, everyone in this room, I'm not sure if you've done a 24-hour fast yet, but everyone in this room has gone 24 hours without food and drink. Everyone in this room has done that. So you know you can do that, though your body needs food and drink to survive, that you can forsake it to seek God's face, and to draw near to him, you can do that for 24 hours because you said, God says set this goal to do this. He wants me to not eat or drink from sunset to this time. Well, let me ask you this. What is the point from God wants you to sin until God wants you to sin? Oh, there is none, is there? Okay, if we can go 24 hours by the grace of God, by our own will to go to the grace of God and not give our body food and drink that it needs, what are we doing giving it sin that it doesn't need? Right? Don't tell me we can't do it. That we can't be sinless. Again, I look at the world and, and, and I see all these things, you know, you got people who, who join AA or NA or CA and they're they're dropping their, their 
I'm going to stop being a drunkard. I'm going to stop being a coke addict, stop being a, a heroin addict. I'm going to, uh, people go to food anonymous, they, and they, or people just willingly change their diet, and people can do all these things by the power of their own might. What excuse do we have for not overcoming sin when we have the power of the Creator abiding within us? What could we not overcome? What could we not forsake? Can we not fast from sin forever? One bite at a time. Sufficient for the day. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things should be added unto you. Take therefore thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow shall take care of it. Take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Okay, God tells us to be holy and go and sin no more. Maybe it's overwhelming to think, man, how can I go, you know, if he says three score and ten, that means, you know, i got at least 70 years of life thereabouts. How, how can I go another X years without sinning? How about today? Can you go the rest of the day without sinning? Change your appetite. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must first go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and the third day be raised up. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never be done to you. But he turned and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Jesus said to the disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What are we doing on the Day of Atonement? We are denying ourselves. Can we live a life of the Day of Atonement? Spiritually speaking. Be dead to sin, but alive to God. Every day. I mean, again, what, what good is it if, we, if we've forsake food and drink that day, but we're smiting with the fist of wickedness. If we're spitting on the homeless or what, I mean, whatever. Well, we're fasting that day and that's all, you know, forsaking food and drink. It does us no good if we're not forsaking sin and seeking his face and drawing near to him. We can do that every day. Day by day, moment by moment. Andrew Murray had said, fasting helps us to express, to deepen, and to confirm the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything, even ourselves, to attain the kingdom of God. Again, fasting helps us to express that and to deepen our resolution and to confirm our resolution that we're ready to sacrifice anything, even ourselves, to attain the kingdom of God. Because that's what we're doing. We're giving up. I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to drink this. I'm not going to... We can have that resolution. And this is something I've said years ago, and I, and I, uh, I wanted to echo out. We can have the resolution... Look, I'm never going to eat pig. Or I'm going to have resolution. There's nothing my boss is ever going to say or do to me to make me work on Sabbath. Where's that resolve when it says there's nothing my boss is ever going to say or do that I'm not going to hate him in my heart? Where's that resolution? There's nothing my spouse is going to say or do that I'm not going to be ungodly towards him or her. Where's that resolution? Because if again, if we're all we're resolved about is, is the liturgy, we're we're missing the point. 
I'm just all concerned with forsaking pig and shellfish and what days I observe. We're still missing the point. Our resolve has to be deeper than that. We have to resolve to walk in love and in faith towards God. And walk in love one towards another. And if we actually do that, we will forsake all sin. Because there is no sin in love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 6, he's, Paul says that knowing this, our old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we're no longer in bondage to sin. Are we crucified with Christ? Everyone here is on this side of the waters of baptism. We all should be buried with him and risen a new creature. No longer under Pharaoh. We're no longer in bondage to sin. Again, back to appetites, you know. Many of us grew up, you know, eating ham or pork or very, you know, various things, and you had appetites for it. And you those appetites changed, didn't they? Some I mean, a lot of you, you know, youngins here didn't grow up in those things. But there's a time you you craved a crock of ham. There was a time you you people craved having a lobster or something like that. But your minds have been renewed. But again, that's just that's just that's just an, an out, almost an outside of the cup thing. I want us to bring that inward, and that we come that same way towards things that are really detestable, the whole things of the heart. That we learn to love what God loves and hate what He hates. We are to put to death our members which are on the earth, sexual immorality and uncleanness and depraved passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Here again, these, these, <laughs> these are the, the, the longings, the appetites that people have. And we know we can control them towards food. We know we can control these things. As I said, even the world controls themselves in these things. There's sex addicts anonymous out there. And they, by their arm, by their flesh, by their will, control themselves. We should be greater than that in Christ. We should be glorifying him in the way that we live in this world. Where the, where the whole everyone who sees the body of Christ just had to put a, a hand to their mouth. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> but they put their hand to their mouth because they're shut up by the example that we are. They have no excuse or no finger pointing they can do because of the glory of Christ that is exhibited before them in the way that we live. Romans 8, he says, those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. What are our minds set on? Those who live according to the Spirit, we, they set their minds on the thing of the Spirit. The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace because the mind of the flesh is hostile towards God. It's not subject to God's law, neither indeed can be. Those who are in the flesh can't please God. So if we're looking to satisfy the cravings of this body, and I don't mean the, the, the neutral, natural ones that, that, that God's created of, of hunger and thirst, I'm talking about the ones that are vile and stand against him. Those matters of the flesh and carnality. The thoughts that stand up against him. 
the emotions, the deeds. Brothers, we are debtors. We're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. If we live after the flesh, we're going to die. But by the Spirit, we can put the, the deeds of the body and we will live. Let us walk properly in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and lustful acts, and not in strife and jealousy. But we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh for its lust. I think that's the problem. I think a lot of people make provisions. Think about that. On a day of atonement, when you come for services on a day of atonement, do you, do you bring a lunch bag with you just in case you can't make it? Just in case you can't handle going through the day? I'll, I'll, I'll just bring some Ritz, just in case, you know, make it, just get, you know, just a small bottle of water, just so I can make it through the fat. I, I don't know, I need provisions for my flesh in case I can't make it. No! Not a one of you do that. No one brings provisions for the flesh to make it through the day of fasting. Why do we make provisions for our flesh any other day? To allow ourselves to be sinfully anger or sinfully lustful or sinfully hateful or any of these things that are of the flesh. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ 100%. So again, if you stop and think about that, Jesus Christ, again, from being put in the womb of Mary into the day he drew his last and said, Father, it's finished into your hands. I commend my spirit that he never sinned. Never sinned. And he says that those who are his he dwells in by the Spirit. Can we not walk without sin? If we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make provision for the flesh. I say walk by the Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to each other. You can't do the things that you desire of the flesh if you're walking after the spirit. And if you have the flesh and you think you desire the spirit, you're not going to do it because you're serving the flesh. They're contrary. Those who belong to Christ, though, guess what? They have crucified the flesh with its passions and its lust. Again, we can see it in the physical things. We no longer have a desire for such and such an unclean animal, or we have no such a desire to, you know, uh, no one's going to force me to work on a Sabbath or a feast day. Where is it for the rest of the Christian walk? Where is it for the core of the Christian walk? Love one for another in the body and without. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm ourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. All right? And again, we can sit there to get that, that lesson of afflicting our flesh, afflicting our appetite with fasting, and we cease from eating. But again, the lesson is that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, so we cease from sinning. So if we're suffering in the flesh and the right type of suffering in the flesh, we will cease from sin. We will no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. We have spent enough of our past time doing the desire of the Gentiles. We walked in lewdness and lust and drunken binges and orgies and carousings and abominable idolatries. And I don't want to walk in those things. Those things are deaf. And that's why I gave my life to Christ. New creature in Him. We as workers together with Him, we beseech you that you receive not the grace in vain. 
The grace of God gives you the ability to say no to all ungodliness, Titus 2.12. 2, but he says, I have heard of you in the, in the time accepted, in the day of salvation have I succored you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry is not blamed, but in all things, are proving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, and by love unfeigned. These are things that the ministry of Christ, the body of Christ, will endure, and they will endure much afflictions and necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watchings, and fastings. But they'll do it in patience and in pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, and by the Holy Spirit, and by love unfeigned. This is the walk we're called to. And things have been fairly easy on our walk here in America, but persecution happened until our brethren around the world. And it's coming here. And I hope it produces the fruit he's seeking out of us. That we'll make the choice. I, I just read of brethren today who two bus, bus loads of people and they let the people off the bus one by one. Muslims that surrounded the bus, let them off one by one. Christians. And they said, are you a Muslim? No. Stand for Jesus Christ. You, you renounce Jesus Christ. Except Islam, no. Shot him in the head. Next one. Are you a Muslim? No. I'm a Christian. Turn from Jesus Christ. No. Except Islam, no. Slit their throat. One by one, let off the bus. Started with the adults down to the kids. Every one of them said they'll stand with Jesus Christ. Every one of them lost their physical life. Don't be surprised when that's happening here. Where will you stand when someone puts a knife to your throat in that end? If we don't put our knife through our throat now and curb our appetites for Christ, where are we going to stand when a Muslim puts a knife to your throat? Are you going to choose your own physical life over eternal life in Jesus Christ? Because if you're serving the flesh now, chances are you're going to serve the flesh then too and you're going to deny him. And you'll have no advocate before the Father. We've got to get serious about our faith and serious about the way that we walk, and serious about the way that we epitomize God and Christ and the, the, the example that we are here. We need to watch and pray that we don't enter into temptation. The Spirit is indeed willing, the flesh is weak. The Spirit is truly ready. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it isn't of the Father, it's the world's. The world's passing away in lust. If he does God's will, remains forever. So if we hunger for his kingdom, for his righteousness, for his will to be done, then we're actually fighting for the eternal things. These other things that we're chasing after, it's all passing away. And we'll find ourselves also passing away. As we close here today, I want to ask you guys to be continually asking yourselves this. What are you hungry for? Are you hungering for righteousness? Are you hungering for a world that knows Christ's love? That's his kingdom. Where do you need to curb an appetite so you may hunger more deeply for the kingdom of God? Pray on these things, brethren. And again, use the things God give us, the hunger, the thirst, as reminders to hunger and thirst after him and his kingdom and his righteousness and to forsake all the dainties of this world. 
that we do have the power by the Spirit of God to put the knife to our throat and not hunger and thirst after the things of the flesh. It is the grace of God, once again, as Paul told Titus, that gives us the ability to say no to all ungodliness.